hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. Well, a little bit handicapped here. I hope things go well because we lost internet in my office and I had to run to a hotel. That's how dedicated I am. But I might not be able to go in the chat room because the uh, internet here is not so good. We're hoping it hangs in there. Tonight we have a great guest lined up, Jesse Marcel III. But before that, we have an astronomy clip with Andy Fleming on our magnetosphere, which uh, you probably know that has to do with saving us from being fried by the sun, like Mars probably went through. Um, it may have even had life at one point, but uh, lost all its atmosphere, and that we hope never happens to us. Our newscaster, John Tobin, and I actually recorded a session last night for the UFO News And our audio systems had some type of allergic reaction to each other. Um, It was either that or he was making a blender full of frozen margaritas and just not telling me about it. But anyway, here is the clip from Andy Fleming in the UK on the Earth's magnetosphere. Hello, Martin and listeners. Today we're taking a look at the magnetosphere, which is a protective field that extends for thousands of miles into space. Its magnetism affects everything from global communication to weather patterns. Created by the Earth's spinning molten core, its existence means that charged particles of the solar wind are unable to cross the magnetic field lines and are deflected around the Earth towards the poles. Now this causes beautiful auroras, sometimes appearing far south of their endogenous polar regions, like the recent displays in the mid-latitude zones. This life-protecting magnetic field has decreased by 15% over the last two centuries. Now some scientists think this could be an indication that the Earth's poles are about to exhibit a long overdue flip. The Earth would be exposed to ozone layer damaging solar wind, while power supplies would be wiped out, the climate is changed, and cancer rates, I'm afraid, would rock it. A recent Danish study concludes that the magnetosphere has far more influence on climate change than carbon dioxide levels, and says the Earth is experiencing a natural period of low cloud cover due to fewer cosmic rays entering the atmosphere. In November last year, three spacecraft were launched as part of the Swarm mission to uncover the threat of magnetic field change and map it more accurately. Historic evidence shows how dramatically the field has decreased and it appears that every few hundred thousand years the polarity kind of flips so compass would point south instead of north. A continued decline of the field over billions of years would see the Earth looking like Mars, a once oceanic world that has become dry and barren. However, the rate of decline is too fast for the Earth's core to simply burn out, and it could be that the Earth's poles are about to undergo another flip. If this occurs, it would cause the Earth's magnetic shield to be weakened for possibly thousands of years, opening up our defences and causing cosmic radiation to get through. Scientists point out that a magnetic flip would not be catastrophic, and not all of the effects will be bad. The much sought-after spectacle of an aurora would be visible every night all over the Earth, as solar winds hit the atmosphere. 
There remains, however, much more work to be done in understanding the properties of the Earth's core and how it generates the magnetosphere. I'll be back with more astronomy news next week on Podcast UFO. Well, thanks, Andy. That was great. Uh, really enjoyed it. And, you know, if you're listening live on the Dark Matter Radio Network, please jump over to podcastufo.com right on the sidebar. It's a one-two click. You're into our chat room. And you can ask our guests this evening some questions. I can read them. I may not be able to participate much in the chat room, but um, I can certainly read off questions to uh, Jesse Marcel III. And uh, Jesse Marcel III grew up listening to his grandfather and father, both talking about what they actually held in their hands related to the Roswell crash. And I'm pretty sure it had nothing to do with, with a weather balloon or any type of spy mogul, as the Air Force concluded in the 1990s. Roswell just will not go away, and the truth will always need to be separated from the myths, of course. There are many, many myths, but it will be talked about until we know the truth behind what we're actually seeing in our skies. Don't forget to sign up at the chat room and hang in there for, the, uh, for our guest tonight, Jesse Marcel III. Jesse, how are you doing? Great, how are you doing? Good. Uh, can you come up a little bit closer to your phone? Is that better right there? I think so. Um, we'll bounce that off Keith. Keith, how's that sounding? Um, he says it'll work. That's great okay, success. <laughs> We've had all kinds of uh, little uh, things happen tonight, but we're, we're getting through this, and uh, uh, we're going to have a good show, and I'm so glad to have you on, Jesse, and I want to tell you, um, I had reached out to your father, or just started to reach out to your father, just before his uh, his passing, and uh, my condolences to you and your family. And i got to tell you, I was at a conference in uh, Maine just after he passed away last last year, and um, there was so many people talking about him, and uh, Peter Robbins uh, talked about him and had pictures of him, and uh, it was really, um, the room was, you could hear a pin drop. Um, your, yeah. your, your father was very, very well respected, and uh, I've never heard an unkind word spoken of him. He, I mean, he definitely he he really legitimized, you know, the story of Ro- of Roswell and the rest of it, just because he was so closely attached to it. And the same thing, his story never wavered. And he was also, you know, he was a medical doctor, a colonel in the military, and you know, he 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 every time he talked to it, talked about it, he was also putting his reputation. In both those areas on the line. Yes, yeah, and I will talk to you about that um, a little later on. And okay. I want to uh, say hello, everyone, to the on the chat room. I'm not going to be able to participate a little uh, too much tonight. I'll try here and there. We had some internet issues, but um, going all the way back to your grandfather. Now, I, I'd like to hear um, what I, I always try to figure out what questions to ask that are different than other people may have asked. And my question to you about your grandfather, did you ever hear him talk about Roswell before it came back into the limelight, like in the 1980 or so? Did you hear him talk about it before that time? Well, yes, our family, we spent our summers in Louisiana with him. We were, we, we were all from Montana, and we'd make the long 24-mile adventure during the summers. And that, st- that started basically, you know... In the the mid to late seventies, you know, around seventy five is when it started, and it was always a topic of conversation. Wow. So even before Stanton Friedman, that kind of thing. I mean, we grew up bathed in the story, of course, through my father originally as as very young children, and were taught to respect the idea that there was life in the universe off of the earth, and that and that there was you know civilizations that were very technologically advanced to the point where they could come and visit us, basically. So I want. Another thing I'm wondering is how your family, including your father and grandfather, reacted when all of a sudden Roswell was the topic of the century, so to speak. You know, it's funny, as it, I, I, and that's a very good question. Um, on the family side, there really wasn't much difference. 
Mm-hmm. And we, we had talked about it and, uh, you know, I, I guess embraced it would be one word for it. But it didn't really change too much. Uh, my grandfather, I, I, I saw more of him when we weren't down there because of all his interviews and that kind of thing. But that was more on, you know, the latest documentaries float, floating around, that kind of thing. But uh, really not much. I mean, the the summers were, were down in Louisiana and then the weekends my, my father and grandfather always had a... a, a a Saturday morning phone call, but that wasn't all about Roswell. It was about how well she was doing in the latest football game, actually, and that kind of thing. <laughs> so it was just it was just incorporated into a part of your life. And now, did you talk about this situation with, say, your friends and you know other people in school or something like that? You know, a little bit, and it, 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 it more that end of it came more through my father, in that uh, when we were little kids, he. He, he walked out in the backyard with a, a, a pickaxe one morning, and within about a month, he had dug a hole and, and, and built an observatory, huh. and all by hand, <laughs> he, 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 with concrete to putting the blocks up, to fashioning, buying aluminum sheeting, and making a dome. He even uh, the, uh, uh, one thing is he he built a, a computer to drive the thing, and that was long before such a thing really existed. He he bought these little little glass tubes wrapped wires around them. Each one was an X or an O or an on or off button, and he created a, a star mapping system. He was, I, you know, he was, if anything, he was uh, an incredible physicist, a brilliant, brilliant man, a good, good doctor, the rest of it, but his heart was really in physics. But uh, anyway, back to the story. Uh, so we had an observatory, and that was directly related to Roswell. It was it was his search wow. for life. And uh and he always embraced the school system. Uh, we'd have Friday, Saturday nights. Sometimes we'd have classes and then hordes of kids over at the house. Everybody looking at the observatory, and it was and Roswell was spoken of. Uh, never, never to the alarm of anybody. Always very positive um, on that matter. Anyway, you know another thing that I heard about your father in particular uh, uh, several times, and again at that conference last year was that your father was a true patriot, and he really, you know, really, uh, it really meant a lot to him to serve his country. Yes. Yeah, he, he in, in, the, in his, uh, yeah, I hate to put it, winning days, because they weren't winning at the time that we knew of anyway, his, I mean, some of his responses would be that, you know, please remember me for what I did for my country. And that, Instead I mean, of that Roswell. <laughs> yes, yeah, that was it. And he really, on, a, on, a, on, on his side, he was hoping to live long enough to hear the, the our government publicly talk about Roswell and, and release the information and and to finally, you know, bring the bring it to light. But uh, but no, he he was he was very proud of his military career. And you know, it's it's because you know Roswell, his father, and that kind of thing that it, it was almost kind of intertwined. Right. But you know, I would think that he would have a, a sense of betrayal. Um, with the government, as they, you know, constantly brushed off Roswell and came up with, you know, the crash test dummies that was impossible because they weren't even... Sure, all that crazy yet. nonsense, yes. So did he ever feel, to your knowledge, did he ever feel betrayed by his country in that way? No, but he understood there was a big distinction between his life as a military officer and some things that the government was doing. Um, he had some meetings, uh, the one well, I think is fairly public known, publicly known, with uh, Dick D'Amato, and where he was, uh, where he basically went out and had a conversation with Dick D'Amato. Actually, he had him go out there, and they they talked about how not not the question of Roswell being real or not, but basically that uh, funds were being diverted to do this cover up of Roswell at the time. This is the late nineties, but uh, it and they talked about you know that that. Those funds were being diverted to what people, you know, there's some quasi-term, the black government, the you know, hidden government, the whatever, whatever you want to call it, and they were actually they were investigating that, and, and Rosa was the basis of their investigation of how funds were being derived or being being, uh, you know, scooped in that direction, and he always he always did have the distinction between the government that you and I know and then the government that uh, is somewhat subversive. Well, again, uh, if you're listening live right now, you can jump over to Podcast UFO. And a two-click sign-in on our chat room. You can ask our guests this evening some questions. For the person, like, say, in listening right now, and say, like, Switzerland or the Ukraine, that may not have a whole sense of the Marcel family and Roswell, can you just kind of, in a nutshell, go over 
the story of of uh, your grandfather bringing the debris home and uh, handling it and all that. Can you just kind of give the whole story? Sure, in, in great brevity. The, uh, uh, <laughs> a ranch named Brazel, out in the uh, basically outside of Rosa, New Mexico, near Corona, had uh, heard a large crash in the middle of the night. A large explosion rattled his uh, little farmhouse or ranch house, and he investigated investigated it, found some really strange debris, ended up talking to a local sheriff in Roswell, who in turn called the military base because it had some extraordinary, uh, something, beyond, something he couldn't understand, didn't, didn't understand what the material was, had never seen it before. Uh, that phone call led to my grandfather's boss, like Colonel Blanchard, and uh, as my, my grandfather was the head intelligence officer for the 509th bombing group. And he was the perfect person at the right time to, to be sent for primarily for initially over to the Wilcox office to look at the debris and say, yes, this is, looks pretty strange to me. And uh, that's where he was sent out, uh, along with the disinformation officer, to look in, the f- in a field full of this kind of debris. Uh, my grandfather, uh, when he saw it, his, in, his, in his own words, he said that this was not made by human hands, hmm. period. No question, never weighed on it. Those those were his exact words. He also knew how the military worked and knew that this was extraordinary and it would be no time that the this would be all swept up and that it that uh, probably out of you know any a civilian view for a number of years, maybe maybe indefinitely. And he broke records or broke broke his uh, basically the the, the his uh, apologize for the word. Anyway, he went basically against regulation, um, to go to his house that night with, with some of the debris uh, where he woke up my father and his wife, Vio, uh, to show him the debris and to say, this is something extraordinary. I want you guys to see it. You, you know, it's something probably nobody else has ever seen. And uh, laid the debris out on the floor, and they tried to make some kind of sense for it. At, at the time, the technology was, you know, tubes and wires and that kind of thing, and none of that existed, and debris brought home with them. Um, just some interesting uh, sheet metal, very lightweight sheet metal, uh, little beams that turned out to have uh, symbols on them, if you look at them at the right angle, almost like a holographic image, and uh, like a black plastic or a brown to black plastic material. Um, with that, uh, later, later that morning, he brought it all to the base, and uh, that was that was really the beginning of it. He was really the, if I've always coined it, he was the lead investigator, and he ended up becoming a lot more involved later on, but... Uh, that's kind of the, the, the story in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you. Part. You know, one of the things I it just came to mind is why didn't anyone that handled this stuff take pictures quietly? Actually, he had this in your house, right? In his house in, in Roswell, yeah. yep. He had it I in mean, house. in his house, yeah. And he could have just snapped a picture. That would have been... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think he was still mindful of his orders. And he was, I mean, just, he was, I mean, he was the head of intelligence for the most elite you know, uh, a military group in the world. And I think he was still staying tight to that, and he, 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 he wandered a little bit outside of that, but uh, stayed close enough. Now, there was, there was a time later on that uh, the Latchers were actually pretty good friends with my grandparents. And after it was all said and done, apparently he brought over a little piece and they examined it at the house. And this was after, uh, you know, months after it was all long gone and uh, brushed away. You mean they, had to talk they, about it. they actually held on to a little piece of it for a while? Is that what you're saying? This is the great mystery of the time, is that he <laughs> brought it over to the house uh, mm-hmm. to show to, 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 to basically sit in. To the, they played bridge at night on the weekends, the, the Blanchards and the Marcells did. And he brought a piece over after everything was done so they could take a look at it. And that piece is somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where it's at, but it, it ended up somewhere. I'll know, give you 500 bucks if you find that. <laughs> yeah, but you got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and don't bring me tinfoil either. Hey, um, <laughs> someone on the message board, Peggy's asking uh, what you meant by a disinformation officer. Um, basically, the, the, uh, a disinformation officer is, was sent out with my grandfather to look at the debris. They wanted somebody on the spot to be able to create a cover story. Now, the disinformation officer it was not truly a military officer. They're a government official. Hmm. So from the, from the get-go, they wanted to create a cover story if it turned out to be what they thought it was. And he rode along with him, and my my grandfather dispersed him back back to the back to town before my grandfather left with the debris to go to his house. 
But uh, it was, uh, you know, I don't know if it was normal for the military to do to bring somebody like that along. But in this situation, yes, they 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 did not go out without a cover story being written up to, wow. to basically to cover it. Yeah. Now, did your grandfather, or had you ever talked with your father or your grandfather? Did he interact with um, fellow officers about this? Did they? I mean, I can only imagine that if you saw something like this, you know it would leave such an impression that you couldn't keep it to yourself. Like, for instance, um, you know, you hear of your grandfather, Mm -hmm. and then you hear of other people that were involved in it. But there had to be so many military people that were involved in in cleaning this up. And the thing that always gets me is that you just don't hear a lot of people, like it wasn't, I know a lot of people took their oath uh, uh, very seriously, but mm-hmm. they mu- there must have been a lot of talk between themselves. Have you ever heard anything about that? He does, and his his basically response to other officers who were involved were because you know the the typical military they they didn't want one person involved in the whole like all everything that Roswell meant there all the all the investigations like kind of thing was all separated, and uh, some of his friends which were fellow officers. Um, he basically said, I wasn't privy to that information directly, but you can believe what they had to say, and they were talking about a, a second crash site, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So it was a hot topic. In fact, um, when the mortician, if you know the, the, yeah. along with the story, a mortician came over with, uh, was, was asked to, to build some small caskets, and even in his remarks going over the thing, they said that, that Roswell was a, a flurry. Uh, there was, a, you know, the, the population on the air base was much greater than normal. And that, there, like I said, there's a flurry of activity. Right. So it, it, was, it was quite a big deal. There is, a, there is one really interesting facet to the whole situation, and that at the uh, near the end of July, when things started, at least on the surface, appearing they're quieting, quieting down, my grandfather and Colonel Blatcher were both set on a two week leave of absence. And I know from my father, or grandfather's side anyway, that that leave of absence wasn't to go home, it was basically to, to escape all. Uh, you know, eyes from both the, uh, you know, civilians and also the the, the relegation that there wasn't a, a need for, um, you know, more paper could be drawn up. But he was right. He you, and Blanchard both got it at the exact same time. I'm sorry, everyone. I I'm in a hotel room. I'll, I'll repeat for the guests, for the uh, people that are just starting to listen. I'm in a hotel room. Uh, my uh, internet went down at my office, so I'm dedicated enough to rent a room to do the show <laughs> and my microphone just I couldn't attach my microphone properly and I thought I had it finally and it just jumped right off of the table so uh sorry for that noise um you know that made me completely forget what I was going to ask you <laughs> <laughs> uh, um well like I said well you know back to what you're talking about I mean there were a lot of officers involved um, a lot of upper-level officers, and obviously, you know, you've heard the stories, read the stories about, you know, the other generals and, and, and commanders, that kind of thing that were involved. As far as uh, the people he worked with, you know, like I said, his friends that were officers, they uh, we know they communicated about it. I know that, you know, he and Colonel Blanchard communicated it up quite often. Really? Um, oh, yes. Now, um, you know the, the uh, famous photograph of the weather balloon uh, debris um, mm-hmm. And did did your your father really get interested when they were able to uh, decipher some of the text in that? My father talked about that all the time. He that did. it was really fascinating that 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 note uh, you know had it you know looked like deciphered that it, 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 there was something about bodies, and I, I, he talked about that quite often. He did. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Um, and you know, I, I thought about that. Um, just recently, and you know, I think as time you know goes along, we're going to get even more and more uh, technical ways to, you know, discern letters like that. And um, I bet you, yes. you know, since th- that's an original photo that they're working with or, or negative, I bet you that thing gets cracked eventually. And you know, that still could be the smoking okay. gun. It it definitely you know. It's out there. It can't be. You know, yeah, it's available. You're right. As technology gets better and better, it's like there, I, I can't imagine there more is going to come from that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And what other things did your um, father f- follow 
in regards to Roswell. Now, there's been a number of people that have written books about it. There's mm-hmm. been a, there are a number of ongoing people still investigating it. Did he ever feel like jumping right in himself and, and doing some investigative work? You know, I uh, that's, that's, that's another good question. Not not so much. I think he was he was happy with his part of the story, and he he definitely had opinions about some, what some people were saying and some people were not saying. But uh, not you know honestly not really. He, he just I think his mm-hmm. investigations went past Roswell, you know, to astronomy, the cosmos. Uh, physics, the ability, you know, what it, he, you know, uh, we had more conversations about the structure of the universe than we did about uh, Roswell in later years. Wow. That's kind of a fascination of mine as well. Um, Andy on the message board, who actually does the uh, uh, astronomy bits in the UK, okay. just asked, wasn't Roswell um, near a nuclear uh, base uh, like Benton Waters? Now that's why, wasn't it, you know, I'm getting my Geography all mixed up. Was there any nukes anywhere near Roswell? Well, you know, you know all I know is it, 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 there was, you know, White, let me see, what's the name of the, there's an air base real close there, White Sands. And White there's, Sands, there's, right. There, there's a lot, there was a lot of activity in the area, and of course, I, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened on the air base directly, other than they, they were the, the, the nuclear bombing group for mm-hmm. the World War, for World War Two. So, I mean, as That's far as right. technology, it was, it was all right there. Yep. Um, I forgot and, and, about and, and that. You're right. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's obviously been question. well, you know, if there was a place that you wanted to take a look at, that, that they were the right place <laughs> to be looking. Yeah. Uh, now, since um, the family was involved in this, another question on the board. Uh, yeah. I imagine, you know, I, I had a sighting myself, and, and mm-hmm. since I have, I'm constantly looking up in the skies. And did your family, anyone in your family have any type of UFO sightings? You know, a big one, me, my brother, and father were out in the country in Montana, and I noticed something strange up in the sky, and we pulled the car over, and we sat and watched it for about 45 minutes, and it was actually, its, it's behavior wasn't that of a regular aircraft. Um, it was just moving erratically, then shot up out of sight. But we, we actually pulled over and sat and talked, or watched for about probably 45 minutes, and that, that is, that is as far as the family goes, that's what we saw. Wow. Um, that's that, pretty that, exciting for 45 minutes. And tell me you, you took pictures? <laughs> you know, no, we were just looking. I don't, I don't know if we even had a camera. She probably did a okay. hand phone or cell phones back then and that kind of thing. It was well, well before I, that. But, I know, um, I know. You know, that's one thing you never think of is, like, back then, no, <laughs> you know, either you had your camera with you in the glove box or you didn't, you know? No. I mean, we, we would spend, you know, it was always interesting in the night sky in, in Montana. It was, you know, we, were, we lived out in the country. It was completely dark. Uh, no no light, wow. uh, no radiation, or no no, no um, pollution, excuse me. And, you know, we, it, was, it was fun to look at, you know, uh, look up and see satellites all over the place, and then you might pick one out that maybe was going forward and made a 90-degree abrupt turn, that kind of thing, where you think, well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, because satellites don't behave like that, but that's obviously something, you know, floating around up there, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um now, I want to also ask you, did your your father was in the medical field, and Correct. he had been for years. Now, in the medical field or um, when he was serving the country, either way, did he ever get any ridicule about this? I mean, people probably recognized his name, That anyone that's looked into Roswell. You know, not that I know of. I mean, there there was... <sighs> His biggest, I mean, his biggest thing that ever happened that I recall as far as uh, ridicule, which might not be ridicule, is that at one point the government came forward and said that my grandfather was never in the military. What? And Yeah, <laughs> and my father, I've never seen him get so upset. Oh, jeez. And uh, he, you know, it, it basically, he, he, he got it all straightened out, and he said, yes, it was an error. And, okay, yes, you're right, he was in the military. But there was a period in the, in the I would, it would have been the very early 80s, where they actually said that my grandfather was never even in the military. Oh, my God, that's, that there, sounds like an ongoing cover-up, doesn't it? Yeah, they, they, well, and then, you know, imagine that, that you know, the, all the records on Roswell burned up in a fire during the short period that Roswell had, you know, the 1947, middle of July, and that kind of thing. Um, and it just, a lot of amazing coincidences, but that, as far as standing out, now, there, there were people that would, you know, and they don't really exist as much, you know, today as they did maybe 20 years ago. So people that really went out on the edge speaking against anybody who saw anything. 
And I think there were some things written about my father, which he more, more or less just laughed off. Because if you know, is saying if you can't if you can't attack the you know the proof, then you're going to attack the person. But my dad was pretty impenetrable. I mean, he he was you know he was I mean a great American hero really, and uh, they, you know they tried, but it really you know he just slept it off. It wasn't it wasn't very important to him. He knew the truth. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble holding my mic. I have to oh, move sure. it again. <laughs> Pardon me, everyone. Um, if you could see the way I'm. If there was a camera in here, you'd, everyone would be laughing because I have this mic on a big <laughs> arm that swings down, and the whole arm is what fell on top of me. <laughs> oh, no. So now I'm holding it. Um, now, didn't your, your father and your grandfather write a book, and uh, didn't it get some heat? This is from the message board. Now, he, that my grandfather never wrote a book. Okay. My, oh, now father, father or grandfather, I'm sorry. So your father, father wrote a book. did. Right? Yeah, and I, you know, I, I I don't know of any heat that so much came of it. There's a, um, you know, it, it was it was. I think the only thing that people were upset about the the book was that it didn't really have a lot of air, much much outside of the uh, what's already out there. Uh huh. Um, my my father, he kept a little more of his personal life personal, and I'm not quite sure if that was mixing or whatever. But you know, overall, not really. There was a. I know I was I was there when the whole book was when we were putting the book together. So I, not yeah, not that I know of. Um, like I, I I actually have a book out myself that we did. It's kind of a, a tragic story. Is it, it put together it was research for half a dozen years outside of which what the family was involved with, and uh, he was, we were going to go on a book signing tour together. And when I was oh. in Texas uh, on a little vacation with the family, we got a phone call that my father had passed away. Hmm. And literally, when I got home, a, a box of books from the publisher was sitting on the front desk, oh. on the front step. So it, he never, he never got to see the finished product. And that was kind of the next step in the whole journey. But it just didn't happen. Yeah, that, that's really sad. Um, I want to talk about um, the debunkers because yes. there's been so many debunkers when it comes to Roswell because it's you know it's the case <laughs> is you know it's the go-to case um i think when it comes to the whole ufo scenario and uh-huh. how did your father deal with the debunkers you know before you answer that you know there is the story about some i think it's a toy company that somehow had um like higher hieroglyphic well, i'm having a hard time saying that um the hieroglyphics on the beams, they thought that's where that came from. And, and they had answers for everything, you know, answers for everything. And, uh, and there are some adamant um, debunkers out there that just really attacked Roswell. And, and what did your well, father feel about that? Well, if I could address all, each of those situations. One, there, there was the, the Dr. Moore who came up with the story that the scotch tape that held the Rowan targets together was left over from the war, and it was actually Christmas tape, and the Christmas tape had <laughs> symbols, Christmas trees, and and I, I happen to have all the, we, we went back and I actually have all the tapes, which was released by Scotch and all those kind of things, those time period, and you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting story. The the biggest thing that I have is, is that's where we went through when we were doing this book, is we have pictures of that tape, and then we have pictures of all the Rowan targets and highlighted where you can see all the edges on them, and the edges didn't have any of these ta- this kind of tape on them. Perfectly clear. There's a, there, it's, it's nonsensical what they were saying. I mean, you, in their own photograph, their own photographs prove that, that what they're saying there's no truth to. Um, as far as the debunkers go, there were a lot more of them in the 80s than the 90s and even now. Um, and it, it's it usually the, you know, my father would always welcome a skeptic. Uh-huh. Always. You know, it, it, you know, maybe it was this. Well, you're right. You know, it was it was always very welcome. Where it wasn't welcome, it was because, well, you were, you know, like I said, if you can't talk about the information, they try to attack the person. They just, right. you know, relegated them to no. To, but honestly, you know, there was, there might have been some attacks going on, but uh, they, you know, it was, it was small enough that, and and at least within our family, we knew the truth that it really didn't phase anything. You yeah. know, we always looked at a lot of people. It's one thing to be a skeptic and be reasonable and and bring up evidence. You know, there's all you know all the, what 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 it could have been, what made sense. Great. And when other people are are doing it because 
they just have an axe to grind or whatever, then those kind of people just kind of dismiss. But it seems like there's less and less of those people um, now. Uh, definitely the younger generation, uh, I have a couple of young kids, you know, on the next couple of generations, and they are, they more or less want, they, they like to see the proof, but they want to be proven that it's true, not proven that it's false. Right, right. You know, uh, one of the debunkers, or, or a lot of them, I should say, are saying, well, the whole explanation behind this whole thing and why it was kept such uh, the top secret is because of, you know, it was the mogul uh, spy balloon to hear if the Russians were, you know, setting off nuclear weapons and uh-huh. all that. And so they'll go right into that and they'll just stick with that. That's it. That's it. And that's the end of, end of story. And I actually I actually know a, uh, a, a ufologist, basically, that thinks Roswell never happened. <laughs> so there's a lot of people that, you know, you know, attack the story about the whole thing. But there's a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of questions. Um, you know, I'm still baffled by the two different crashes. And, yes. you know, whether it was a collision, whether it was an escape pod, um, you know, mm-hmm. there's all all kinds of um, theories behind that. And I, I think Stanton Friedman thought it was a, a collision. And another researcher, you know, thought it absolutely was not. It was a, probably part of the ship. And that's where the crew was in and, you uh-huh. know, all that. Um, uh, did I just ask you a question, or, or am I rambling? I can't. Oh no, no you're talking. No, no. I, it, it is. You know, Stanton Friedman. He, he definitely, when you talked to my grandfather originally, kind of brought the the story public. I, now, I wasn't familiar with exactly what Stanton Friedman said, as he thought it was a crash. Our, we've always had our own ideas, you know, uh, about what happened, what might not have happened, as far as causing the crash, why it was where it was, those sort of things. Um, you know, back to the raw and target. You know, it's that that's that's a, that's that's a good argument. There's one thing that kind of pulls that one apart. If somebody, a debunker, really wants to go back and investigate, then look at my grandfather who just graduated from a radar intelligence school where they studied, amazingly enough, Rowan targets and the Mogul projects. And to think that he went out after getting a diploma in that exact area and not <laughs> understanding what he was looking at is crazy. So you're basically you're caught in a position where. You either believe that my grandfather was just part of a grand scheme to create a big story, and there was a lot of collusion, or there was something to it. You, you really got to fall on one of those two sides of the line. Like I said, the, the, the mogul balloon can be there's there's so many holes that can be shot in that thing. Even you know, Doctor Moore he, he met with my gra- my father one time, and they both agreed to disagree about some of the material. Like for instance, like the. The, the foil on a Rowan target had a white paper backing, and, the, and everything that my gra- grandfather and father talked about, it was the silver foil had no backing, it was very thin, that kind of thing. I mean, little things like that. Number two is Rowan targets were, you know, they had basically a microphone and a recorder in them. Uh, none of that existed in any of the debris. They also had, you know, a stream of balloons, 24, 30 balloons, lots of uh, twine, that kind of thing. None of those was found at the, at the crash site. Another point, I think I could rattle this stuff off. Um, when was the last time you saw the military throw out a, a top secret project and make pictures of it and put it all over the newspapers, you know, to, to keep people from, you know, investigating Roswell further? It just, it, it, like, it doesn't make sense. We, it, the military wouldn't do that. And the, the Mogo Balloon Project was top secret. The materials in it weren't top secret, they could be found on a shelf at a store. But the actual purpose, I mean, you, they would, they just, they, they picked the better of two evils, in my opinion, that they, they, they threw out the Mogul balloon and let the whole world know what we we're doing with it, even though up to that point it was completely top secret, you know, versus anybody else talking about Roswell being a UFO, which, you know, kind of doesn't make sense. Right. Now, was there ever any doubt in, with your father or grandfather that this was an alien ship? Hundred percent with my grandfather. Absolutely, it was not from here. My father, what he said, you know, basically, it didn't make any sense. The only thing that made sense to him was it came from somewhere else. And like I said, he, in a way, devoted his life to it. His studies, his yep. study of, of astronomy. So, you know, and in his mind, yes. I mean, there there was never a wavering. There was never, you know, anything that uh, anything but this. And, and so, you're talking about two people, first-hand witnesses, that actually handled the debris who believed completely was from somewhere else. And like my dad kiddingly said, you know, so these raw one targets, they're held together by balsa sticks. You know, I, I had I had models hanging from my, air, from my ceiling in my bedroom. They were made of the same stuff. Like I said, as a child, I'd, I, I would have figured that out. Right, You know, right. Not, to, not to batter that same old idea. But it's just like I said, you, they, they, they believe 100% it was from somewhere else. 
And then it just boils down to the integrity of the people involved. And was there collusion throughout the country and even some parts of the world that this was just some made-up story? Right. Now, when your grandfather was out in the debris field, he was out in the main debris field. Is that correct? Correct. The first debris field, the large one, yes. And getting back, I know you mentioned something about the the other site. Was that mm-hmm. was that like a known fact through you know everyone that worked in the first debris field? Did everyone know that there was another uh, crash site? Not at the beginning. It was kind of the need to know. There, 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 there were people. There, there were people on both sites, and they weren't. They they didn't interact. They weren't working together on it. I see. At that time. Yeah. Now, it, now the the story, and my grandfather wasn't directly involved in this, so uh, so I can speculate or go by what the other people have researched as far as, you know, the, the area is being cordoned off. There is, a, you know, a scraping up every little piece of metal they could find. Um, in fact, I, I I did research. I have a, my uh, one of my projects. We went through everything, and and our argument is actually there's three crash sites, not just two, just wow. by by patterns and 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 the, and the traffic and different sightings from different people and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, there was a lot going on. Now, do you remember? Wasn't it like forty miles apart the two crash sites, or was it even further? I, you know, I I, I, would, I, I, should, I should know that, but I, but it, it, was, it was it was I think it was at least forty miles. Yeah, yeah. Now, who do you think the best researcher? I know you probably don't want to point the finger or uh, point it away from someone, but who do you think the, is the best researcher right now when it comes to Roswell? Do you want to say that? You know. Uh, it's really hard to say. If you're talking about from the, you know, the the UFO side, um, gosh, uh, you know, Stanton Friedman was always a favorite, and then, you know, mine honestly is 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 you know Donald Schmidt, uh, Kevin Randall. Uh-huh. Uh, they both seem to have their thumb on it. I, I like uh, Kevin Randall. He's he's very uh, he's uh, methodical. And not given to fancy and and very precise about what he says. It kind of reminds me of my father a little bit, actually. And Donald Schmidt is an incredible historian, right? And he, there there isn't one topic about Roswell or people involved that he couldn't cha- he couldn't state chapter and verse <laughs> mm-hmm. of exactly what happened. So I, I would say those gentlemen. Now, did you ever know of your father um, talking to other uh, witnesses? You know, I know after Stan Freeman's you know uncovered, mm-hmm. I forget how many exactly. And that kept growing and growing. And I think there's something like 600 now in total. Yeah. Um, but had your had they ever spoke with? Have your father ever spoke with any of the witnesses? Yeah, some of the townspeople that were living back that time had contacted my father in later years, mm-hmm. and and had talked about it. Um, he some of the stories were dead on the way he remembered it. Some of them were kind of fanciful. So I, I, I couldn't give you a name of a specific person, but uh, but no, no, definitely some people. Had, and it wasn't my my father. Honestly, wasn't actually pursuing any of them, but some were actually pursuing him. Right now, I know you know the town of Roswell has kind of gone kind of gone crazy. A lot of it, um, you know, you, you drive through and there's um, you know it's pretty. Bu- there's a lot of bizarre things going on there, and there's some sure, sure. there's some <laughs> bizarre fringy people there too. Um, mm-hmm. And that visit there, especially, you know, on the 4th of July. Um, what did your father, and what do you think about the fringe part of this and how it can muddy the water of what really happened? You know, I, it's, it, it's all, uh, yeah, I mean, we've honestly tried to, you know, kind of stay away from the, the absolute fringe. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's you know, as far as them muddying the waters, you know, some definitely they they think, oh, it's just a bunch of kooks out there. But you know, even in some of these people around the fringe, some of their stories are actually pretty amazing. And mm-hmm. so, you know, some are you know, I, I honestly I, I give it that you know, this rough eighty twenty. Yeah, you know, eighty percent of what's out there is probably not a whole lot of truth to. But there's a little nugget of something when some of these people are saying. Um, like I said, I I try to like I just I was I, uh, talking to a gentleman earlier this morning about this. Is that I I kind of use my grandfather as the as, as the you know the the yardstick and my father. Mm-hmm. And if it gets too far away from what my grandfather, it, uh, I was lucky enough to spend my summers with my grandfather fishing with him. So we had a, we talked about a lot of different things. And if if it's too far from what he, the way he talked about it, then I I tend to think it's more fringy. I I, I don't tell anybody you're just playing crazy, but. Uh, you know, I, I try to, like I said, I use him for the yardstick, and depending on how far you get away from that yardstick's where I kind of lose. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Now, did did your father know Dr. Ed, 
Edgar Mitchell? Yes. Um, I yep. bet they they, they 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 seem similar in a way, like yeah, similar he's, type. He's, it, it, definitely. I mean, we all, uh, I and my sister Denise and my father were all at the citizen hearing last year, and uh, right. mm-hmm. and he was part of that, and it was it was kind of an interesting event, and uh, um, it, you know, definitely no, they they do see eye to eye, and actually, my father was good, good friends with a number of astronauts. Um, one of his favorite was actually a cosmonaut. Oh, really? um, that he he was that he the he, he kept in, in pretty tight contact with, and you know it was just because you know some of the things that they had seen by you know when they're you know in space with they're just completely astounding, you know very credible people saying yeah there's something watching us you know no question about it, and they always like to you know anyway that so he 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 really enjoyed the the uh, the uh, you know the kinship he had with these people. Right, right. Now, what do you think the future is going to be? When it comes to the whole Roswell thing, I mean, do you, you must contemplate what you think may come along as time mm-hmm. passes. I, you know, what's interesting is Roswell is not losing any of its enthusiasm. Right. Um, if anything, I, I just did a, 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 I just came back from Brazil and I did a little tour and had to give a bunch of lectures and it was that the book I have they published in Portuguese down there, wow. and. When you talk to these people, it's very fascinating because they view Roswell as not only the truth but the beginning of it all. You know, not, not that there was things there in the history, but that was what really made people's opinions start looking. You know, that made there something to all this. And it, like I said, if, if anything with them it is very powerful, they they not just Roswell, but they look at these experiences as being almost religious. They, hmm. Some countries will build monuments to sightings in you know, in Latin American countries. Completely mm-hmm. different tact on it, but yeah. uh, but if anything, it's 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 a very hot topic, and it's not losing any of its enthusiasm. Wow! So let's talk about Brazil. Um, that is a, one of the countries that does take it serious, along with Chile too. Oh yeah, very much so. Yeah, Chile, Uruguay, uh, yeah, all the uh, there was the, the like one of the conferences I was down there was fun. Uh, it was. I, I actually I, I was able to, the lecture that the, the the person I was with was actually a, an astrophysicist, and we it really, he was he was he was part of the team that was there not as a debunker but just kind of like well you know that's interesting but you know it, we kind of see it this way in the science world, but uh, it, it was just it was a very nice crossing across you know of, of the different people involved, and uh, we had talked about Roswell at length and. Uh, Everybody, it was just complete fascination. Some people showed up just so they could talk about, you know, just they, they wanted a first hand uh, to, to, you know, to talk with a, you know, Mar- Marcel or whatever, however you want to put it, um, about Roswell. Like, so they, they really embrace it 100%. Wow. That's really good to hear. And um, had your father ever uh, toured in any country like that? He was, they had a world conference in, I think it was 97 in Rio, mm-hmm. and he was part of that and really enjoyed it. Right. Now, and uh, he he was actually going to go there with me again. Of course, that didn't happen. But yeah, yeah. that was. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, when he had his practice, was he able to get away whenever he wanted to for these conferences? I, uh, you know, honestly, he didn't do that many. But yeah, he he would he had a private practice, so mm-hmm. he had, he did have the luxury as long as it was planned out far enough. He just planned his surgeries and you know office visits and that kind of thing away from it. And usually, you know, a lot of times it happened over a weekend. Now Brazil was it was I think uh, you know he they do have conferences you know medical conferences and that kind of thing and he, was, he managed in certain part, parts of the year to be able to, to be able to leave and there was another another doctor in the small town of Helena at the time that could take over the caseload when he was gone so he, he did manage to do it it was really important to him so yeah well we do want to talk about your book and and uh, can you talk a, a little bit about that what it encompasses and everything it, it's just it's, it's 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 a fully illustrated like a tabletop book. Mm-hmm. Of Roswell, it it, it kind of goes from steps A through Z, um, oh. uh, and 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 it also gets kind of little personal insights and anecdotes from our family, some little fun things that happened and 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 not so fun things, and just kind of a just kind of an inside look at everything, but it, in a very it doesn't it doesn't read like a history book or it doesn't read like a you know like a, a, a some sort of a documentary. It's more of of a novelistic approach. I see. And how long did that take to put together? Mm. About three years. Oh. By the time it was always done, and then um, it's it's I it's, it's in five languages right now. Wow, um, that's great. And it's and it's it's actually doing fairly well. It's kind of it's it's not 
you know, I hate to call it the baseline, but it's it's kind of like everybody's book on Roswell. If you want to, if you if you're a believer, non-believer, I've heard of that. That sounds kind of interesting. The illustrations were are, are amazing, and they did an incredibly good job. The the uh, it's it's a, it's actually like it's you consider it almost like a graphic novel. Um, it, but uh, it, everything is well supported, and uh, the the partner I had in researching it is she's a, a PhD out of England, and her PhD was in World War II aircraft technology, huh. and it just it just fit like a dovetail into our research. Right. So and it, where, it was interesting. Okay. What is the name, and where can someone find that? Well, it's Alien Crash at Roswell. Not too imaginative, of course. <laughs> and uh, you kind of cuts to the point. <laughs> <laughs> The publisher did that. It was, it was supposed to be called the Blue Room, but he changed it, or they changed it. Uh-huh. And it's called and it's uh, jessemarcel dot com. You can go there. Oh yeah, and okay. and get it if you if you want to sign copy. Uh, you know, it's at bookstores and that kind of thing. When when we did the book, it's kind of funny that the at the same time we did the book, the publisher said, "Yeah, we'll do the book, but you have to do a documentary if you want to do this." And I said, "Sure." So I I, I and Philip Coppins, I don't know if you're familiar with the name. Oh yes. he was one of the co-creators. He Taylor. passed away as. Early, I mean, young. Yeah, hey, it yeah. was, it was, it was awful. He, we, we, we did the documentary, and that, like, it was like, and he, he called me, and we were talking. I think it was in late October, early November, and he said he just wasn't feeling right and was going to go get some tests done. And I literally, within a week, he was gone. Wow. He yeah. was, it was just. He, I know. He, he I, was I, such an incredible individual. That was uh, like was on amazing. Facebook. He was in the hospital, and the next thing you know, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It, he was he was gone. Just uh, he was taken in weeks. I mean, it was a very very rare form of cancer. And he uh, we did a documentary. It's by the exact same. I mean, it was a book. They're supposed to complement each other, but it's it, it was it was really sad. I mean, I didn't go get, get to know him. But we were we we're actually working on. A, I was, I'm I'm working on a feature film called Grail right now, and it actually it it, it started with it when I was writing this book too. But it was really developed, and I and I and uh, we we had some really good conversations about it. And he actually helped me mold some of the ideas in it. And, then, and of course, then he passed away. It was really tragic. Right, right. Now, I remember, this is kind of off the message board right here. Sure. There was a woman that wrote um, that she had solved the Roswell crash as being as being the Nazi craft filled with little people. Do you remember that? And and people were buying into it. Do you know who I'm yeah. talking about? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, there's, you know, there there is... Uh, there's some validity, you know, to what they're saying as far as, you know, because Hitler was involved with some, you know, some some kind of a technology, nothing that, nothing that would rise to the level of being able to, you know, get into our airspace, you know, do these kind of things. But it's it's one of those things that, yeah, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I, I you know, I, I, I don't think it is, but it's not, it could, not out of the realm of possibility as far as being little people in it, you know. Yeah, I, I've heard all these stories. We we never, as a, as a family, as far as my father, grandfather, and, and us, the grandchildren, have never taken any credence in it. But you know, as far as if you want a backup idea, I think it's 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 just as credible as a Rowan target, <laughs> <laughs> or a fire balloon, or any of those kind of things. Right. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's it's really something how. You know, people want an explanation, and if mm-hmm. they don't have one readily available, then they'll work on something until they get one. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And um, what are some other bizarre ones? Can you think of some other bizarre ones that you've heard about Roswell? Uh, you know, Marcy, there, there, there's some around the world. I, one of my favorites is when I was in, in D.C., I was with a, a Air Force pilot from Uruguay. And he had talked about they, they they scrambled two jets because there was some kind of strange aircraft over their airfield, and they were told to shoot it down to get that it was it was you know and there was full radar contact. In fact, there were hundreds of people on the ground looking at this happen, and they went into a full. They were trying to shoot this thing out of the air, and he was actually showing me with his hands, you know, how it, it moved so much faster than they could possibly keep up with. And he thought, well, I, I took my airplane. I, you know, I wish I could recall which, what, what the airplane was. But he said he ended up by going to a full scale, full outright climb thing. He go up a climb, and then flip over, and then come back down at it, and and that way he could break, you know, catch up enough speed. And he said, I'm going straight up, and I look at my window, and it's just floating right up along with me. Uh, 
and it's it just it's some of those firsthand. He had the documents with him. He was showing me the military reports. They weren't hidden. Uh, it just some of these amazing stories from these aircraft pilots that they're saying. And they said that yeah, there was hundreds of people on the ground watching this crazy thing happen. And they said and they they tried to shoot. They said it was so much faster. They had they had absolutely nothing they could do. They said there's you know there was shoot down. They said it, it was it was a joke. They were so overmatched. It was just a joke. Huh. Wow. Wow. Um, someone just wrote on the message board that they thought there was a the CIA's explanation in the 1990s or 2000s. This is this story is what you're talking about. The one I'm talking about right now. Yes. You know, I'm I'm not quite sure the CIA had anything to do with it. Honestly, I didn't know anything about it until I met this pilot last year. Oh, okay. And so I I just I, like I said, all, all these people, you know. I've learned not to, you know, and it's, it's funny, I, it, at the, at, I had a really good conversation with some of the congressmen in D.C. kind of, you know, after hours we talked, and our, our conversation was simple, and that was everything we're talking about, you know, this being seen, this, this testimony, that it's important, and my position was it's it's important, but it's inevitable that we will have you know, something sitting across the table from us at some point now, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, whatever it will be. But no matter what is going on now, it's inevitable that we are, we will have, you know, out, outright living contact with whatever these things are. I believe so, too. Um, Andy on the message board from the U.K. had heard that it was the Russians, little Russian people that were <laughs> in some type of craft. So you, the story does get twisted all over, you know, it, that's I, I, you know that's that's interesting. I yeah I don't know. There's there's a lot of stories and a lot of hypotheses. Uh, you know I know the, the the basics of it anyway. The the really heart of the matter. You know and I've got, you know it's and it's easy for me to say because I was right in the middle of it. If I was if I was somebody on the outside, I don't know if I, maybe I wouldn't I wouldn't be so you know invested in the in this uh, story. Right. But yeah. I know I know just from being having a front row seat to everything. That you know, my goodness, this whatever this thing was, it, it it wasn't from here. My my grandfather was not a fool. My dad not a fool. And to think that they could not have figured out that this was something as simple as a Rawan target, or even if it was part of an aircraft, you know, was of Hitler. I mean, their technology wasn't that advanced that they still didn't have the, you know, they still had sheet metal and rivets and you know those kind of things holding things together. You know, it's it's not that you know that there's uh, like I said. I think if you keep it simple, that there really isn't another, uh, that the option is that it's something from somewhere else. Yeah. Now, we probably have about a minute left here. So okay. just just want to know, uh, what, what is your future in this whole thing? Are you going to stay connected to to the Roswell story and, and and do your part into getting it out there? Yes. I, you know, there's, there's more and more people... And it's, it's more than Latin American countries, just I'm going to be doing more tours through Argentina and Uruguay and the rest of it, talking about Roswell, talking about the heart of the story. A, a little bit picking up where my dad left off, I could say. It mm-hmm. might be a way to do it. Um, so absolutely, it's 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 there. I, I do have a love of, of and I probably grew out of Roswell, but uh, a love of science fiction, that kind of thing. So I'm working on some projects. We're, gonna, we're, like, we're doing some movies and, and a feature film. It's going to be... Uh, really, Roswell's the heart of it, but kind of a, a, a different way of looking at the whole thing. It starts out with uh, uh, Catholicism a couple thousand years ago, and then works its way through today, and then in the future. But uh, so, yeah, the Roswells is definitely a big part of my life and my family's life, the other grandchildren. Well, Jesse, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. Really, All right, thank you. For really having enjoyed on. having you on. Well, that's it for our show today. If you missed any part of the show, you can catch it as a podcast and a whole bunch of other free podcasts on our website, which is podcastufo.com. Also, you can check out our links to stories in our show notes. Uh, you know, we don't have any links or show notes this week because we didn't have any news, so I'm going to cancel that part. And I want to thank everyone for helping out with the show today. Our guest, of course, Jesse Marcel III, Keith Rowland for the producer of Dark Matter Radio Network, Andy Fleming for the astronomy look, Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse for the music, Peggy Shunning for managing our Facebook page. And remember to like us on Facebook for all the latest UFO and astronomy news. You can check out you can check us out live right here at the Dark Matter Radio Network every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And don't forget to jump in the chat room at podcastufo.com. This is Martin Willis saying keep your eyes to the sky and your curiosity high. See ya. Mm-hmm.